Let's talk about fighting game lore. Believe it or not, every fighting game has some form of story as to why the characters are fighting each other. Some games are relatively simple, with matches taking place in a tournament for a prize pot, with other things being added to spice up the setting. Generally, some sort of evil, shadowy organization pulling the strings to mess with the contestants and end the world or something. But anime games, they're, uh, they're different. A few months ago, somebody asked me to make a video about Gilly Gear lore. No problem, I thought to myself. How complicated could it really be? Oh god, this law's got hands! This might be harder than I thought. If only there was something that I interacted with literally every single day that I could examine and extract the meaning out of that gives us insights into these characters which the story mode wasn't able to. Oh yeah, the songs have lyrics now. All these bullshit blazing, to my heart is blazing. If the word kill me, I don't need a new in the previous Gilly Gear games, the characters used to have their own individual themes that would play, but they were primarily instrumentals. Songs with lyrics were generally saved for special events or just hype tracks in Exard. But with the transition to Strive, Daisuke went, You know what? Fuck it! Every character is not only going to get their own unique theme, but they're all going to have lyrics that center around the characters, and we're gonna put our fucking heart and soul into it, and they're going to slap, and you can't stop me! And now we're here. I really like basically all of these tracks with some minor exceptions, but I do have to say that some tracks here have more lore in them than others, so if it feels like we're skimming over your favorite character's theme, I do apologize. Lord knows I'm gonna have to do my main dirty, so I feel your pain. So without further ado, let's get this started. So bad guy. The first time I heard Find Your One Way, me and my friends all had the exact same reaction. Yeah, that's definitely a soul theme. The song is sung as if Soul's negotiating with someone who's stolen something from him and he's aiming to try and get it back. It shows his dominating aura and standoffish nature while still making sure to present him as someone who's fair. Soul won't hurt you unless you hurt him first, and he'd rather just be left to do his own thing. The only other line of major interest in this song is, I'll take the wasteland, but I won't be alone. Up until Strive, Sol spent most of his time wandering the ruined earth as a bounty hunter, so he's used to being alone. This line could refer to two different events. In the Exard story, Sol was taking care of Sin, Kai's child. And maybe through this, his bond with Kai, Sin, and Dizzy has grown stronger, and he knows no matter what happens, he'll have somewhere to go where he won't have to be alone. Alternatively, this line could be referring to Arya, Sol's significant other, through Jacko, who's traveling with Sol at the start of Strive's story. After hundreds of years, maybe he's just happy to be with his wife again. Who can say? Kai Kiss. Despite being the most vanilla character you can get in Guilty Gear, Kai has a lot to do with lore and events in the entirety of the Guilty Gear franchise. For context, Kai was the best knight in the Holy Order when humanity was at war with the Gears. Through the events of Guilty Gear XX, he meets his wife Dizzy and they have a son called Sin. Dizzy is a gear which makes Sin half a gear. Now, this man just spent years killing his wife's race and now he's not only married to a gear, but he has a gear child. Roar of the Spark is basically about that. Kai's entire worldview has been flipped on its head after meeting Dizzy, and on reflection, he's feeling pretty depressed about it. But he decides to stand strong and face the world that he helped create, and move forward with this newfound knowledge to make things better for everyone else. taking his role as king seriously. He's moving past the scars he's taken, and he's ready to lead people into a brighter, more peaceful future. May. May is one of the members of the Jellyfish Pirates, a crew of orphan girls run by Johnny. Since he basically adopted all of them, he sees them as his children, and most of them see him as their dad. Most of them. You may not know this, but May has a MASSIVE crush on Johnny. Basically, all of the events she partakes in during the Guilty Gear timeline have something to do with her wanting to impress or protect Johnny. She knows it's weird that she's got feelings for her surrogate father. The first verse and pre-chorus even sound like her trying to take advice from other people to get over Johnny. Over
By the time we reach the first chorus, she's being true to her feelings. Knowing that they're here to stay and there's nothing that she can do about them. My Verse 2 emphasizes this more, literally ending with the line, I can't live without that precious one. It's a love song, there's not much more to say about it. Apart from the fact that it's fucking weird, like what? Axel Lowe. Axel is a person who's able to manipulate time due to, uh, Guilty Gear bullshit, and he accidentally slipped from the 1990s to way in the future when Guilty Gear is set. Before the events of Exard, Axel wasn't able to freely control his abilities and would slip in and out of time, but he's not too phased about all of it. He's always been a pretty relaxed guy who tends to try and avoid conflict and just vibes with people whenever possible. Like, listen to this and tell me it's a guy singing about how he's sad that he can't see his partner. Happiness is your plenty. The song does have a neat narrative arc to it as well. In the first verse, Axel is talking about how his days are different from others due to time moving differently. He repeats the line, it's like my time is frozen still, which can be taken as him feeling disconnected from the world around him, or you could take it literally as it's him being trapped in a frozen piece of time. If we do decide to take that line literally, however, the bridge before the final chorus shows his Axel breaking out of his frozen time and learning to finally take control of his powers. Also, the chorus is him telling us his Wi-Fi password, and I won't be taking any criticism on that. Chip Zada. Chip's had a pretty hard life, being addicted to drugs and left to rot on the streets. An assassin was sent to kill him after he failed to pay his debt. Instead of killing him, the assassin taught him how to be a ninja, and now he's the lovable president of a kingdom we know today. The majority of Chip's song is about his mentality and how he faces problems. The line... The line Summarizes the entire strong pretty nicely. Shit sucks. It's gonna suck for a long time. You can roll over and die, or you can give it your all until you get taken out. Don't give up. Fight like a tiger. Be free till you die. Hoorah! Bet you didn't think Potemkin had any character apart from Bustin, huh? Armorclad Faith is a scathing critique on the condition of Zep before Pot helped lead a revolution to overthrow the dictatorship. Man, what the fuck? From this, Pot's backstory is fleshed out even more. He's the way he is now because of the people who oppressed him, and he led the revolution because he couldn't take it anymore. The other line that shines a light onto Pot is in the post chorus. While this could be referring to the events that happened in Exod where he lost to Bedman and Ramlethal, I think it might be better to see it as his doubts about what he's doing. He might not be seen as a hero of a savior, but a clown who tried to do something impossible. Even so, he had to try something or else everyone was dead. Good job, Pot. Faust. Oh boy, okay, so this one is extremely complicated. The song is somewhat of a mess coherently. A lot of the things being said in the verse are hard to hear, and as if they're being mumbled or whispered to you. There's also several points in which more than one voice is singing the lyrics as if they're in conflict going through his brain or soul. Faust is... Kind of going through it in stride. So a lot of this seems to be reflecting the conflict he's going through. He's a miracle healer who saved the lives of countless people, but before that he was a psycho murderer who lost it after the death of one of his patients. He's upset that he can't save everyone. 
The song jumps around in a chaotic manner, even getting eerily cheery at some point as if he's trying to mimic how he was in XX and Exard, until eventually we hit the bridge where there's a sense of clarity. After this is the final chorus and all of the voices begin to start agreeing and singing in harmony with each other. Apart from that, I don't know man, there seems to be a lot that I can't decipher. Maybe when he says Messiah will not come, he's referring to himself or referring to how he's run away to sort things out. Or maybe he's just not a believer in God. I think that's part of the reason. A lot of the things about current Faust are somewhat unknown, so having his theme be a chaotic mess fits extremely well. Melia Rage. Melia was trained to be an assassin since she was a child by the Assassin's Guild, mainly Zato, who was their leader at the time. She didn't want this lifestyle, however, and because of that, she grew to resent not only the assassins that trained her, but herself. Melia's theme looks at the internal conflict that she has with her life and what she has become due to the hands of others. The last line of each verse asks the question relating back to Melia's appearance. It's important to note that the second verse is an extra song with the lead, which could be Milia's demons personified. The song mostly tackles the issues of Milia learning to love herself despite her past and attempting to move on. It could be noted as well that she may be referring to Zato in several lines. Zato 1 Zato was the leader of the Assassin Guild after Slayer. In the events of XX, he fucking died, but was resurrected in Exile. This is important to note as it caused Zato to lose all of his emotion, thus making him a basically empty shell of a man. The song is pretty heavy, with the intro being muffled and almost immediately being overtaken by the first verse. There's something Zato is reaching for, but he can't get to it. He's trapped in an abyss where nothing can escape from. The future, the past, the present. None of it has any cohesion. Everything becomes a blurry mess in his mind, and he feels literally nothing day after day, and he's struggling to find a reason to go on. It all feels extremely out of reach, and he can't see why he should keep going. When he doesn't know what to do, he just recoils inwards, letting Eddie lash out for him and drowning everything in darkness. The whole song is basically another internal struggle for his desire to feel again and struggling to find a point to go on. Now, there's a few tracks in Strive that do something pretty clever that could only really be done in a fighting game. Zano's theme is really long, like really long. So long, in fact, that it's impossible for players to hear the entirety of it in a normal match. But if you take the time to just sit and listen to the theme, you get this absolutely beautiful verse. I once had some sweet memories. Its world remains all the same. How can Hear me! 
fucking chills, dude. Zano can actually feel things when he's around Millie. The song is basically him struggling to hold on to the hope to feel something, and eventually he finds it. He makes it out of that dark pit he's stuck in, and he finds Millie. He promises to be the shadow that's always with her, and he's finally found a purpose. By giving Zano the time he needs to go through his issues, we're able to finally resolve this problem. Fuck, this one's so good, dude. Ramlethal Valentine. Ramlethal also has a problem with understanding her emotions and the place in the world. As a Valentine, she's basically a machine and was originally designed to feel nothing. This left her confused about humanity and the events in Exad had her figuring out what her place was in the world and has her going through the entirety emotional arc of loving to learn things like her dog and cheeseburgers. The track goes through the learning process of hers, starting out barren and void of instruments, with the first lines being sung in different languages. As the song goes on, more instruments are added and things become more clear and uniform. The first verse is just filled with emotions as if Ramlethal is learning about them for the first time. After the first chorus, the song gets faster and more chaotic, as if learning more things is causing her to become more and more confused. The world isn't like what she was programmed to believe, it's completely different. After some deliberation, she realizes that the world is perfect as it is, messy and confusing. She's happy being a part of it. The song ends with this. The world can be painful and confusing, but it's made of love, and she understands that now, and she wants to show it to people. How beautiful. Leo White. Oh man, Leo's a pretty bombastic character. I sure hope his theme really plays into the parts of the character that we've all gotten to know and love. Leo is one of the kings of Illyria, the kingdom that Kai is also a king of. He was part of the Holy Order and fought alongside Sol and Kai in the Crusades. Hellfire is about how he's led countless men to their deaths and has fucking survivor's guilt. It's basically an extended panic attack in the form of a song. There's lines where Leo is trying to reason with himself that he had to do it and he should live on for the other people that died due to his actions. He literally asks for forgiveness several times, hoping it will make him feel better. Does it work? Fuck no! He sees himself as a coward, a shepherd leading lambs to the slaughter, and nothing he says helps him rationalize it out. So what does he do? He goes back in. Bring it you the song shows us why Leo is fighting in this game. He came to that fight in your match to die. He's running at you with as much unga and bunga as possible because it'll be so much easier for you to take him out that way. He becomes so much more powerful when he lets his guard down because he's fine with dying. Fuck, dude. Leo's deep. Nagori Yuki. Now, Nagel's kind of complicated because he has two separate themes and they explore very different topics. His main theme, What Do You Fight For? and his arcade boss theme, Crawl. Let's start with the main theme. Nago is a honorable vampire samurai. He's a follower of dandyism, like all good men are, and thus has a strong sense of style and dignity which he carries into combat. What Do You Fight For? represents the vampiric side of Nago. Unlike Slayer, he isn't easily able to access blood whenever he needs it, meaning he has to seek it out until he cannot deny his first any longer. He still likes to keep his honor about him, however, preferring to fight his opponents in an honest combat and taking their blood that way. The song also references to his mortality. When hell freezes over, Sayonara is basically a joke about how he can't die because, you know, vampire. Nago is simply trying to find his place in the world, but his need for blood makes that harder for him. He's asking himself what he fights for, and the answer is to feast and stay alive. Now, Crawl is about how life fucking sucks.
In the story, Nago became the servant of Happy Chaos, and he resents him greatly for it. He was literally locked underground for several hundred years, for fuck's sake. He's allowed to be pretty pissed off about it. Because of this, he doesn't get to choose his own destiny, and he has to listen to Happy Chaos's commands for the entirety of Strive Sorry. He hates this and wants to rebel against it. The thing he wishes for more than anything right now is a peaceful and normal life. He could roll over and let Chaos do whatever he wants without any restraint, but then he'd just be a pawn, and he doesn't want that. So, he's gonna use every bit of his strength to resist, to fight back. He's going to crawl. The sky above a thousand rainbows, now fate has a deeper word. I gave up hope. But I'm not going to be lost to my heaven and this is hell. I'm gonna crawl. I want the freedom of God. Geo is part of the American Defense Force. Her role in the story of Stripe is to make sure the president doesn't die. Her song is about how she doesn't want to be involved with what's happening. She's got a job to do, and she's here to do it. It's nothing personal, just forget she was ever there, and move on with your life. Honestly, the fact that she doesn't want to be part of anything might explain why her theme is pretty different from everyone else's. While most of the themes in the game go for a heavier rock aesthetic, Geo's theme just sounds like the Beastie Boys. That's it. I wish I had more to say about it, but apart from the possible horny posting in the song, she literally just tells you, politely, to fuck off. You know, a lot of these songs are about people's beliefs, their past, their mentality. I wonder what Angie has to say for himself. I went to a fair with a really cute girl, and it was like a date, and we danced, and we had mochi, and we stayed up till really late, but it was just us two, and I fucking love her, dude! She changed my life, and I need to tell her! <laughs> Now, technically the song could be interpreted in other ways, but fuck you, okay? It's cute to think he's singing about bacon. It also gives this line a really cute meaning. Icon has been through a lot of shit over the course of the Guilty Gear story, but Angie made a promise and he intends to keep it. He will carry her heart with him wherever he goes. If only he had the balls to tell her. Yeah. Eno has been the main antagonist of the Guilty Gear series since XX, having the ability to travel through time, similar to Axel. She attempts to stop the blank future by alterating a past and splitting the world into different timelines. If you're wondering why I'm not going over the entire lore of Guilty Gear, blame this bitch. Eno's theme is basically the reverse of Axel. She's able to control her powers from the start, but instead of being optimistic about the future, she's pretty pessimistic about everything. She's able to see the loveliness of the world. She sees everything, but she doesn't feel like any of it matters if she can't change the future. She doesn't know if reaching her goal is even possible, and if it does happen, then what? She wins and... That's it. She knows she doesn't have anywhere to go back to. She says herself that her memories can't be trusted. Let's take some strawberries and go to the hill. If you want to defy your words, bring it to the sky. The pictures in my head tell me a lot of stories. None of this is real. In the end of the song, Eno just hopes that even if she does fail, her death will be the catalyst to a bright new future. 
I got a job to do. I'm gonna do it. Look at me. I'm such a cool character. Wahoo. Gold Lewis's theme is about even though he's the Secretary of Absolute Defense, he's just another pawn in the system taking orders from those higher up than he is. The chorus has the lines bark and bark reoccur several times. This could be a reflection of the people above him barking orders at him that he has to follow, or how he sees himself as a guard dog for the American government. It seems to mirror Potemkin's theme. Instead of having somebody learn to lead a revolution and fear they may be seen as a clown for doing it, it's someone who's part of the system that resents it, but doesn't have the balls to take action himself. Who knows? Maybe he'll lead a revolution one day and actually do something to impact Drive's story. Jacko. Jacko. Motherfucker, this is an anime intro, what? Jacko's theme is just a bunch of things that make her happy and how she wants to pursue these things to live out a happy life. Presumably with Sol. I think it might be her planning things to show or do with Sol since they've been separated for so long, but uh, I'm gonna be honest guys, I'm having a really hard time trying to figure out this one. Like, it feels like the lyrics have nothing to do with anything. Like, what does all of this mean? Chaos. Happy Chaos is a complicated character. I'm sure his theme will have a lot to talk about. It took me ten years to find the answer something. I forgot about it in two seconds. That's about it. You've got to be fucking with me. Happy Chaos is a model and doesn't really care about anything. The fact he doesn't care about anything means that everything to him is amazing. By having no connections to the material world, he's able to view humanity through fresh eyes and he's happy because of it. That's about it. Bye, Bye, Ken. Mirror of the World starts with the Mantra of Light, a popular sutra used in Japanese Buddhism. This is able to show Baikun's heavy ties to her nationality as a Japanese woman who had everything taken from her. She is bitter and seeks revenge. She wanders the earth as a lone samurai, attempting to vanquish the gears. But times have changed, the world has changed, and she needs to change with it. At the start of the song, Baikun sees herself as a relic of the past, wanting to be rid of all anger and frustration she has. She turns that hatred inwards, not sure how to release it. She attempts to shun herself away from everyone else, literally asking, Why would anyone leave me alone? After what was probably some reflection through the instrumental, everything cuts out and there's a sense of clarity. Yeah, I have. I wonder what I would tell them. Yes, yes, I knew the answer. Holy fuck, she's singing about Angie. Oh my god, she's singing about Angie! He fucking did it! Let's go! Let's fucking go! Yeah! By gaining a comrade, Angie, she's able to get rid of her vexations and learns to move past them. She aims to become a mirror of the world. She wants to reflect back onto people the kindness and support that they've given her. She moves to a, be a better person, and it's all thanks to the people who loved and stayed with her. How cute. Testament. Testament's theme is... weird. Testament was originally the child of Cliff, but died and was resurrected as a gear. They were controlled by Justice to fight them. Justice was defeated and Testament regained control of themselves, and they began wandering the world looking until eventually they found Dizzy and swears to protect her due to how she was treated by some villagers. So what's Testament's theme about? Well, uh, I'm pretty 
sure it's about Testament finally finding a purpose by wandering the world and seeing as much as they can, flying through the darkness to see what tomorrow has in store. They've accepted who they are and they're going to make the most of it by exploring this beautiful world. However, it could also be them singing about Dizzy and Cliff, which would make sense if we didn't have lines where the pronouns that they're talking about keep switching, which makes me think it's about themselves because they're a gender, but if it is, then... Testament, what the fuck are you talking about? Honestly, Testament in arcade mode is just passing through and checking out the site, so let's say that's what their theme is about too. And that's all of them, at least for now. There's a lot of personal interpretation in music, so just know that most of these are how I personally feel about these songs. I could be right, but I probably didn't get them all 100% correct. I'm sure that hasn't stopped some people from rushing to the comments to tell me how I'm wrong, but joke's on you, fucker. You're helping me with the algorithm. <laughs> Let me know what you think about the songs in the comments below, or on my stream where I'm playing Strive right now. Come join. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Yeah.